This is part one of a three-part video series on the Essex hot air engine. Hello again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher, and I am sitting before an antique Essex hot air engine, caloric engine, and this was made well over a hundred years ago. It's patented by Henry Essex in 1903. So this will be a two-part video. In this first part, I'm going to talk about the engine and its features and its characteristics and things like that. And then in part two, I'm actually going to run it or attempt to run it. So be sure and watch part two when available. Now, I had several videos out that were temporary videos where I was requesting help from people to uh, learn a little bit about this. So if you've seen those, you're going to find that there's a lot of repetition of this because I want this to be a standalone video, not dependent on the other temporary videos. I recently purchased this at a public auction for top dollar, so at the end of this video, I believe I will put a short clip of me actually bidding on it at the auction. Also, at the end of this video, will be the original patent papers and some other information like that presented in the way of still pictures. So be sure and watch those still pictures at the end of the video. I did quite a bit of research preparing to make this video and you will find on YouTube quite a few videos of people running these but they are slightly different models. That is they're cooled by different methods some of them are air-cooled with a fan, and I see one or two that are water-cooled, but with a different type of water jacket than this. This one is water-cooled, and here is the water jacket. Also, the ones that are in the uh, other videos do not have the chimney on them. I do not know if the chimneys are missing or never were on there. Probably got lost over the years. Again, this is not a toy. This is a engine that was used on popcorn machines or some other machine that did not require much power. It is only 1 45th of a horsepower. Now that's not very much, but remember this is about the time when electricity either did not exist in the average home or business or it was in its infancy. So these were useful engines. I'm not sure of all of the purposes of it, but they were sold not as a boy's toy, but as basically a motor. Now these are sometimes called external heat engines because they have a burner. The burner is down here. I'm going to show you close-ups of that in a minute, but this one appears to be alcohol or kerosene fired. Some of them would be natural gas. Also on YouTube, you'll find a wonderful series of videos on building one of these by the wonderful Myford boy over in England. He's got a 15 part video. Also, he sells plans and casting so you can make your own in this size. They're not reduced in size. So that's a little background of the engine, what it's used for and now it's just kind of an oddity, but let's uh, talk about it and then see if we can't get it running. I haven't had it running to this point. This engine is constructed of cast iron castings, including the base, which is quite sturdy. That It is not a wooden base. The flywheel is six inches, and the length of the base is about 15 inches. The overall height here is 10 inches. And you'll notice that on this end is a heat exchanger or radiator that will be filled with antifreeze or water. So this engine is cooled by water or a fluid by thermosiphonic action. There is no pump. The hot water rises, the coal goes to the bottom, and it circulates like an old John Deere tractor before they used water pumps. Now if you look above the engine and it's not in camera range, why there is the fuel tank made of brass. It holds a quart or two of uh, fuel and the fuel would either be kerosene or gasoline or alcohol. I'm not exactly sure what they used at this point. A brass pipe right here 
a shutoff valve, and then more pipe. This is 3 8 pipe that goes down to the engine itself, makes a bend right here, and goes through this pipe and under the burner to the valve, which I'll show you in a minute when I turn the engine around. Now the engine is lubricated with a little drip oiler right here like you see on hit and miss engines and the oil drops directly onto the piston or should I say inside of the cylinder. Let me turn the engine around at this time. I'm not sure if I said it but Henry Essex is the man that patented this in 1903 and I'll put the patent number down in the description or right below in the video here so you can read that. And he did not build the engines. They were built by a company. I think maybe all of the engines were built by the same company, but I'm not sure. That would be W.H. Smith Company out of Buffalo, New York. So that's a little background on who invented it and where and how it was made. This particular example was probably made a little bit before 1910, so it's 110 years old at least, maybe more. Now the heat exchanger might have been added by the owner. We do not know, or I do not know for sure, this is the only one I've seen that is built this way, but it certainly could be used with a little water pump or just with water out of the tap flowing through it if this big bulky tank was objectionable. And there is a filler cap up here on the top and there are tubes running through so the air would enter at the bottom and rise and then the heat would come out the top. Let, let me take a real quick shot from the top and you'll see there are six or seven tubes just like a radiator. And this is what it looks like from the top. And right here is a cock to drain the fluid out. And whoops, and there is some fluid in there right now. I didn't mean to do that. I'm not sure if you understand the principle of a hot air engine, but on this end there is a piston that fits tightly in the bore and it's a two inch piston and it has a stroke of about one and a half inches. But on this end there is a displacer. Now the displacer is not the same as a piston. It fits loosely in the bore and the purpose of it is to simply move the hot air from one end to the other alternately back and forth as the engine is running. So this rod here actuated by a rod coming from the flywheel is simply moving the displacer back and forth. There is no connection between the displacer and the piston other than hot and cold air. Now let's take a view from this end so you can see what that looks like and the bore is open. And looking from this end you can see the piston and the connecting rod. As a matter of fact the piston extends a little bit from the cylinder. Also you can tell here that the drip oiler would drip the oil right there where it is needed. And these are cooling fins here. If it was air cooled there would also be cooling fins on the other end. Note here that there are two pulleys one a little bit larger than the other and that is how you would belt the machine onto the engine rather onto whatever machine you were going to drive. Now there's also a groove right here for a belt but from what I see in the other pictures that was the belt that would run the fan that would cool the engine on the air cooled models. Rather elegant looking little casting right here. The whole engine to me is quite beautiful. So in addition to the drip oiler or lubricator there's an oil hole right here for the main shaft and what I've discovered here 
is that there's also an oil hole on the connecting rod here, but someone has installed this brass connecting rod upside down, which I will have to correct, so the oil hole is on the bottom, and I'm, I'm assuming that it's probably about the same situation on the inside, where the connecting rod fits into the wrist pin. The operator of the engine, who would be the engineer of course, would be well advised to lubricate the slide rod here for the displacer as well. Now you'll notice that there is compression here. Also an engine like this is really double acting, that is pressure will push the piston out like that and then uh, according to this cycle here for Stirling engines or hot air engines then a vacuum is formed in there and the piston is sucked or pulled back and that's happening rapidly from pressure to vacuum back and forth back and forth as I said many of these are simpler here and can be fired simply with natural gas or propane this one since it's using fuel from the tank way above the purpose of that is to provide a head that is some pressure to the fuel that is arriving here at the burner and I am told that since that is about 36 inches high we have developed about one and a half or one PSI right here so there is no pump like there is on a Coleman lantern or a Coleman camp stove in the next video when I get ready to run this I will add alcohol to the little pan here very much like the way you started your dad's blowtorch I don't mean propane torch I mean the old blow porch, uh, <laughs> blow torch and the purpose of the alcohol or whatever fluid you might use right here it will preheat this burner which I'm going to call a generator or at least my dad did and then once it gets up to heat, uses all the fuel in the little pan or bowl here, then it's hot enough to run on its own, and one would turn the valve on that's up on the stem here, out of sight right now, so that fuel is coming down, and then you, I will open the valve. Now someone told me that this is simply an on and off valve, but that is wrong. It is a metering valve, that is, it's a needle valve. I had it all the way out of there and it looks exactly like a needle valve on a carburetor. So at that point a flame would come out of here and be fired into the furnace. This is called the furnace. And of course a flame or the heat will come out the top it's, and heat is applied here in a tube that runs from one end to the other and then the heat is moved back and forth and we want this end, again I'm repeating myself, to be cool and that's done either by a fan or in this case by the water in the water jacket. In the case of Stirling engines at some point if you run it long enough the entire engine becomes hot through conduction including all the way down here to the base. The whole thing gets hot and at that point it will stop running. So it's very important that this end stay cool and that we have heat in here. So there's a lot of wasted energy as you can imagine. I do not intend to completely restore this engine. I like to keep these old things in their natural patina or as some people say in their work clothes. So. I'm not going to paint it. It's going to look like that even after I get it to run. Now this probably hasn't been a part in a long time and there's a very likely possibility that I will have to take the piston out and clean it and make sure the bore is clean and all of that because these engines have so little power that they cannot overcome their own internal friction if it is excess. and it feels a little bit tight. One must be careful to turn the lubricator off or all of the oil will run through and end up down here in the pan the next day that you come uh, to look at it. And there, 
with a drip oiler, there's just a tiny little sight glass here as well, if you're not familiar with this, so that you can determine what the drip rate or lubrication rate is. And you only need about a drop every minute or two. It doesn't have to be a, a lot. And someone asked me what kind of lubricator this is. It is unmarked. It is not a Lunkenheimer, and I wish it was. Over a period of 20 years, I have made many little Stirling engines, not in this configuration. But I will put in the comment section below, or I should say the description section right below, a playlist link to uh, many of those videos if you would like to look at them. And in those videos, I think I explain a lot more about the principles of hot air engines and what actually makes them work, because that is something I'm not really going to discuss too much in uh, this two-part series. So I hope you enjoyed this little introduction to this engine, just describing what it is and what its purpose is. And in the following video, I'm going to drain the tank, put in new fluid, experiment with a couple different kinds of fuels, and see if I can get it running. I really do not know what fuel is supposed to use. Probably several different fuels would work, but I want to use a fuel that's relatively safe to use indoors. Now, I believe there might be some smoking here because of the kerosene or the alcohol, so it might be unpleasant to run this indoors. One person told me that this engine was used sometimes in store displays in the picture windows, the showroom windows, to run some kind of device that they were peddling. So that would be a, a nice use for this. And this one would run for quite a while until I suppose the fuel was uh, gone and it would not overheat because of the uh, cooling system, which is almost, I think, a little bit of overkill. But it should be pretty nice. Some of the engines that I made were water-cooled, some were air-cooled, and the water-cooled uh, water engines always ran much better than the air-cooled. Okay, I'll see you in the next video where we make this thing run, I hope. That should be fun. See you then. Five, five, we need another one, 175, better than 175, five, better than 175, 175, 175, 175, you're in at 100 and a half, asking 160, 160, that'll be the next thing you want to do, 160, that'll be 160, I'll satisfy, 160, that'll be 160, 60, better than 160, yes or no, 160, 160, sold it, 150, your number is? Number 11. As a sidebar to this video, Lest ye think I know nothing about hot air engines, but I am far from an expert, but I have built many. There is a little Robinson that I built a long time ago. It runs great. I uh, haven't run it in quite a while, but it is in other videos. And remember when I rebuilt this Empire hot air engine? It also runs great, but let me show you a few others. Back when I was still in my natural prime, I made a lot of Stirling engines, and even here you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then this bigger Heinrich, which really runs great. It's laying on its side right now, and I haven't run any of them. They're getting rusty. Can you see that? Luckily, I don't care anymore, and there is a commercially made little one model. You've seen a lot of those, but... Uh, in my videos and in my model making life, I could not find a market for the videos. That is, nobody wanted to watch my steam engine <laughs> or Sterling video. And I guess I don't blame you. Why, why would you? But uh, uh, by the way of information, I just wanted you to know that I do fully understand the cycles, the heat cycle and all of that on... Uh, the Reverend Sterling's uh, engines in regards to what I need to know to make the Essex engine run. 
All right, I got a little bit off topic there, and I did rant and rave a little bit, but, uh, oh, and what I forgot to say, I made many, many more than this, and back then, when I was still in my natural prime, I sold a lot of those, or a bunch of them, I guess, on uh, eBay. And I need to get rid of some of these, too. <laughs>